Arthur Brooks, uh, for many of you or most of you, needs no introduction, but I will, those are the kind of people you make sure you give them an introduction. Arthur Brooks is the president of the American Enterprise Institute and also the Beth and Ravenel Curry Scholar in Free Enterprise at AEI. Immediately before joining the American Enterprise Institute, he was the Lewis A. Bantle Professor of Business and Government at Syracuse University, where he taught economics and social entrepreneurship. Brooks is the author of 10 books and hundreds of articles on topics including the role of government, government, fairness, economic opportunity, happiness, and the morality of free enterprise. Before pursuing his work in public policy, uh, Dr. Brooks spent 12 years as a classical musician in the United States and Spain. Brooks is a frequent guest on national television and radio talk shows and has been published widely in publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. He has a PhD and an MPhil in, pub in policy analysis from Rand Graduate School. He also holds an MA in economics from Florida Atlantic University and a BA in economics from Th Thomas Edison State College. We're now pleased to hear from Arthur Brooks. Thank you. Thank you so very much. What a delight, what an honor it is for me to be back here at BYU. Um, I've been here many times. I think that uh, some, someone once told me that I was the, uh, the favored Catholic on the BYU campus. And if that's true, I'm delighted to take the distinction. This is truly one of my, fa my most favorite places. Uh, I learned all about BYU when I was writing books on the subject of human happiness when I was still teaching at Syracuse because of the famous designation of this place, the Happy Valley. And I will assure you that it is true in the social science data that this is the happiest place in America. Uh, you make it so. And I want to talk to you about how you can keep making it so. And how you can keep spreading concentrically the ideas of goodness to bring happiness to more people here, around America, and indeed around the world. That's my subject here today. And I want to talk about this in the context of, of purpose. See. I'm really going to address my, my remarks to the students. How many of you are students? And, okay, that's, uh, let's just round it off to all of you. <clears throat> um, you know, when you're in college, uh, this, you get the same question from everybody, especially when you start moving toward your senior year. I, I taught university for a long time. It was always the same question to the students. What are you going to do when you graduate? What are you going to do? That is not the most important question. <laughs> the most important question is a little scarier. It's really not that important what you're going to do, believe it or not. What's really important is why you're going to do it. Why exactly are you going to do whatever it is that you're going to do? That's what I want to take about half an hour to talk about with you today. Because if you get that right, you can change the world. If you don't get that right, you're going to face frustration. And I'm going to show you the data, and I'm going to give you some suggestions. Now, the way that I'm going to talk about this, this is purpose, by the way. This is the why of your life and the why of your work. And I'm going to give you some suggestions by way of examples of some of the best that I've ever seen. I'm going to give you three examples of great purpose, of individuals and institutions. And I'm going to start with one that influenced me a lot. You heard in the introduction that... Uh, uh, I didn't start out as a, you know, the president of a think tank in Washington. I mean, nobody does. When I was six years old, I didn't say, Mommy, when I grow up, I want to be the president of a conservative think tank. That would have been weird. Uh, I said, when I grow up, I want to be a musician. That's all I wanted to do is I wanted to play music. I was crazy about it. I was good at it. And, and I grew up, and, and <clears throat> the only barrier that I had is college, which was a, seemed to me a big waste of time. So when I was 19, I dropped out. You know, dropped out, kicked out, splitting hairs. <laughs> and uh, I went on the road. I went on the road for more than 10 years. My parents called that my gap decade. <laughs> and when I was playing uh, all over the place, I was playing chamber music all over the United States, and I toured in 25 countries, and, and I wound up in the Barcelona Symphony in Barcelona, Spain. I went there in hot pursuit of a girl, as you'd expect, um, who demanded that I 
learn the language and move over there to show enough commitment that she might consider marrying me. We're celebrating our 24th wedding anniversary this fall, I'm happy to tell you, and a bunch of kids later, who are all teenagers, pity me now. Um, but when I was in Barcelona, I got a good example of life purpose. I got that example from my favorite composer. Now, those of you who like classical music have all heard of Johann Sebastian Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach is arguably the greatest composer who ever lived. I didn't know him, of course. He lived between 1685 and 1750. He lived to be 65 years old. And what a productive individual he was. He published a thousand pieces of music, keyboard, chorus, chamber music, just orchestra, everything he published. He also had 20 kids. That's productive. And Bach, <clears throat> near the end of his life, was not famous at the time. He only became famous 100 years after his death. He was known as a, a good teacher during his time, which is a notable and wonderful and, and, and uh, laudable thing to be, of course. But he was being interviewed by a minor biographer. And this biography, for some strange miracle of posterity, has been preserved. Bach was asked by this minor biographer, Herr Bach, why do you write music? Now, crazy question, right? <clears throat> it wasn't, what kind of music do you write, or how do you compose your music? It was, why do you write music? Again, how many times have people asked you, why do you study what you're studying, and why do you plan to do what you're going to do? You're not going to get asked this very often. Once you, some of you, if you move to Washington, D.C., where I live, it's all about power. It's all about career. Nobody's ever asked me why I do what I do. People ask me all the time what I do. <laughs> What's it like to run a big think tank? They don't say, why do you do it? Right? So what was Bach's answer? The greatest composer who ever lived. What was his answer? He didn't even hesitate. Here was his answer. The aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the enjoyment of man. Huh. The whole point of music is not pays the rent or I'm good at it or I love music. It was to glorify God and to give enjoyment to men and women. That was it. That was the whole deal. That's life purpose. That's it, isn't it? If you could say at the end of your days, everything I did was for the glory of God and for the good of my brothers and sisters, and you really meant it, wouldn't that be a good life? It had a huge impact on me. Uh, it chased me around for a long time, as a matter of fact. I remember asking myself, I was playing French horn in the symphony orchestra over there, and I asked myself, if somebody said, why are you a French horn player in the Barcelona Symphony? Would I say, for the glory of God and the good of man? Probably not. Probably not. And then later, <clears throat> I went back to school and I became an economist and I asked myself, huh, if somebody said, why are you an economics professor? Would you say, the glory of God and the good of man? Like to. And then later, I quit and I came to the American Enterprise Institute where I serve as president in this, this Washington think tank that's dedicated to better public policy, to serve everybody, to lift up nations, to help the poor, to take your values and translate them into real public policy. And you know what? Now I can say yes. For the first time in my life, it's the most amazing thing. It's kind of a miracle. I can say I believe that I go to work every day for the glory of God and the good of my fellow brothers and sisters. Huh. And that is such a privilege. Example number one, be like Bach. Do it all for the glory of God and the good of your fellow men and women around you. That's example number one. Now, I want to go to another example of a great life purpose that has a different set of lessons attached to it. I live in Maryland. Maryland seems as different a place as you can get from Utah. I mean... It, this place is beautiful and sunny. Maryland is a fever swamp. It's humid and buggy. Uh, this place has a lot of sort of upright, traditional moral values. Maryland is a fever swamp with bad weather. And, and, but I digress. It seems really different. But you know what? They were founded in the same way. And you're going to know exactly why when I tell you the history of Maryland. Maryland was founded by a man named George Calvert. Lord Baltimore, who had never visited before. Now, he was a man of noble birth, of great wealth, and he lived in the time of Charles I. What was interesting about George Calvert was this. He was a Catholic. That's as weird and as difficult 
as being a Republican on the Harvard campus. It's gonna, there's gonna be oppression, is basically what it comes down to. See, this was a time of tremendous suppression of Catholics. Catholics couldn't hold elective office, Catholics couldn't buy and run businesses, Catholics had real trouble with property and mobility, and, and the result was that a guy like George Calvert, who was rich, he was okay, he was a man of privilege. But every Catholic at the lower levels, working men and women, they couldn't do anything. They were oppressed. They were desperate, as a matter of fact. So George Calvert, he hatched a plan. He went to Charles I, and he got claim to all of the lands north of the Potomac River. Now, this was unexplored territory. All they knew were that there were tribes of extremely hostile Native Americans that were there. That was it. There was malaria. There was disease. It was a huge problem. Nobody would want to go there. But George Calvert said, what if I made a colony where the Catholics can actually be free for the first time in their lives. What if I send them there? What if I take a bunch of adventurous, entrepreneurial pilgrims and put them on a couple of boats and send them to colonize and make the new Catholic colony? And you know what he said to himself? I'm going to name it after the Virgin Mary, Maryland. Now, that was easier said than done. You can't just name something after the Virgin Mary. So he went to King Charles I and he said, I have this idea. I'm going to name this colony after the queen whose middle name is Marie. And Charles I, who was not too bright, bought it. And he said, fine, you can call it Maryland. And they did. And they loaded them all on a boat, 128 pilgrims, the most adventurous of all, and one priest named Father Andrew White, who was a Jesuit priest. The two boats were called the Ark and the Dove after the story of Noah. And they set off. Now, it was a terrible journey. There was disease. A bunch of them died. It was dangerous. There were storms. They were, all, they were looking all the time for pirates. There was a big problem with pirates on both coasts. And finally, they made it. They landed in 1634. They left the Isle of Wight a year earlier. It took a long time. They got to, in 1634, they got to Maryland, and they, and they formed their colony. Now, why do I tell you about this? For one thing, it bears certain resemblance to the establishment of this beautiful place, doesn't it? The handcart pilgrims who, against all odds, and, and running for their lives, I might add, to a place where you can finally be free. Now, I say it's really beautiful and fertile and happy and everything. Back then, it was just so salty, nobody else wanted it, or something like that. I mean, this is kind of like the founding of Maryland. This is what was going on at this time. So. Why do I tell you the story about the purpose of this journey? Because Father Andrew White, the accompanying priest, was keeping a daily journal that still exists to this day. He was talking about, we think we see a pirate ship, another storm is coming, five more people have died of disease. It was terrible. But he also recorded the purpose of their journey. Okay? Why are we going to Maryland? Why would we do this? Why would we do this? You could say, because we're tired of being chased around. We're tired of having a hard time. We're tired of not getting jobs because we're victims. Right? He could have said that. Or he could have said, because we want to find our fortune in the new land. He could have said that. No. He didn't say either of those things. Here's what he said. Father White. The purpose of this journey is to glorify the blood of our Redeemer in the salvation of men. Imagine this. You're running for your life, and you say... The reason is to get there and help them. Imagine that. Can we say that? Can each of us say that? I'm going to do whatever it takes for whatever sacrifice comes my way. And I'm going to thank God for that sacrifice because that's going to put me in a position to save more people and to help more people. Think of the lessons that come from that life purpose. What a beautiful, beautiful purpose. That's number two. Number three, Brigham Young University. Hmm. You may or may not have looked up the mission statement of this fine university. You students, you really should, at least before you graduate. No diploma until you look this up. Here it is. Here's at least the key sentence. To assist individuals in their quest for perfection and internal life. It isn't to make better economic actors to make people who are more successful. Perfection in eternal life. You, that's why this thing exists. Crazy. The world doesn't understand that. The world can't understand that. 
But don't you think it's just the best thing ever? Now, by the way, for whom? For you, who else? Me. Why do I benefit? Not just because I get to come to this beautiful place and speak to you, what a privilege. It's not it, it's not it. It's because of what this community, this intellectual community as part of this faith community has done for our country and done for our world in big ways and small. Look, I could tell you about all the, the part of GDP that Mormons have done, that's boring. Let me tell you the little way, the little ways. I'm gonna give you an example of a little way that this place has touched me. I've been coming around for years. Every couple of years I get to give a talk here at BYU, fantastic. The first time I came was in 2006, and I came and I gave a lecture at the Marriott School. And it was fun, and I, I really enjoyed it. And whenever you come to BYU, people give you a lot of swag. It says Brigham Young University. So my kids have Brigham Young t-shirts, and you know, I've got, <laughs> you know, you always get Brigham Young candy. The whole deal is great. And uh, I, at that, that first visit, first visit, I got, uh, the, and Gary Cornea, the old dean of the Marriott School, he gave me a, a Brigham Young University briefcase. Right? It's a Brigham Young University. On it. Terrific. It was kind of nice. It was an Italian briefcase. It was actually pretty, pretty, pretty high quality. And I took it home, and uh, I didn't need a briefcase. I mean, I had a perfectly functioning briefcase. So I took the BYU briefcase, and I threw it in a closet. I didn't think about it. Three months later, the briefcase that I was carrying around broke. The handle broke off. And I said to my wife, ah, thing broke. Thing's junk. It's no good. What do I do? I gotta go buy a new one. She said, no you don't. You got that BYU one in the closet over there. And I said, yeah, but it says BYU on it. <laughs> and my wife said, you chicken? <laughs> so I said, no. And I took it out and I put all my stuff in it. And I started carrying it around. Now, at the time, I was starting to travel a lot. I've traveled a lot for years. And this was the beginning of when I was starting to do a lot of public speaking. So I was in airports all the time. And I was carrying around this BYU briefcase. And I noticed something weird was going on. See, when you're in an airport and you're carrying a briefcase and it says something on it, people read the briefcase and then they look at you. right? And I could tell what they were thinking. They were thinking, I've never seen an aging hipster Mormon before, right? <laughs> that guy doesn't look like a Mormon, but okay. And so, and, 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 but here's the weirder part. It started changing my behavior. I, I realized that I was unwilling to carry coffee while I was carrying the briefcase. Why? <laughs> Not because I'm against coffee. I'm a Catholic. Like, drinking coffee is part of my religion, basically, right? So the reason is because I didn't want to wreck your reputation. And I was trying to live up to your high standards. Furthermore, I was acting nice in the airports, right? Because I didn't want somebody to say, you know, I was standing in line at the airport, and I saw this Mormon guy, and he was being a real jerk. I couldn't stand the thought of somebody saying that about you. It was making me better. It was making me a better person. Do you see what this is? This is moral elevation. Thank you. You helped get me a little bit more to heaven, maybe, right? That's what you can do. That's what this institution can do. That's what purpose can do. When you state purpose, that's aspirational, and it's up there, and then you're trying to live up to it, you change your life, and you change other people's lives, too. Okay, there are three examples. Now I want to give you a little bit of research about the world's purpose. Not those special cases of those crazy pilgrims and this wonderful composer and this great university. No, let me take you to the real world where people really exist. What's the purpose that people state in most of the world? Well, to talk about that, I want to introduce you to a study. It's a wonderful study. <clears throat> Actually, I talked about it for the first time. I just read it last time I came to the Wheatley Institution. So I just mentioned it the last time I was here. Maybe you'll remember it if you came to my talk back then. It's a study from two social psychologists at the University of Rochester. They're, they were experimentalists. They would use human subjects to figure out motivations of people. And I love this stuff. I'm really into it because I'm a behavioral social scientist, so I read this stuff. I read about 15 of these papers a day, literally. And I had read this paper, and it's having this big impact on me because these two guys, these two social psych professors, 
We're trying to figure out about life purpose, about goals, and the quality of your life when you have one kind of goals versus another kind of goals. <clears throat> now, what they did was they had grad they looked only at graduating seniors in, in the year 2004. And uh, they, they took 150 kids, half men, half women, and they asked them a bunch of questions about what they wanted their lives to look like five years later. Right? You're 22. When you're 27, what do you want your life to look, at, look like? What do, you want, what do you want to be doing so in such a way that you're successful? That was the main question. And they found, basically, that, number one, people have all kinds of goals, but you can categorize life goals, primary life goals, into two basic categories. They did this with a thing called content analysis. Okay? Number one are the goals that they called endogenous goals. The two kinds of goals were endogenous goals and exogenous goals. Why do they use this fancy terminology? Because that's what you do in your academia, in academia so you can get tenure. <clears throat> Make up fancy words. So endogenous goals. The endogenous goals were all about relationships. People would say about half the kids, mostly women but not entirely, would say, Five years from now, I'm going to know I'm successful because I have good friendships, have a good relationship with my family, or I'm going to be married, or I'm going to have a better relationship with God. Those were relationship goals. They were endogenous. They were about those you love. Okay? That was the first kind of goal. The second kind of goals were exogenous goals, which in a nutshell are five years from now, I want to be on track to getting rich and famous. Okay? Just pure material stuff, worldly stuff. Everybody's got both kind of goals, but these are primary goals of these kids. The exogenous goals kids said, I want to be making a lot of money. I want to be on the management track. I want to get a lot of notoriety for my skills. I want people to know who I am for all the good things that I do. Money and fame. Okay. So they come back five years later, and they interviewed all the kids, again, all the kids that they could find, and they found two things, good news and bad news. First, the good news. Everybody hit their goals. It was actually spooky. Um, you know, remember your mother told you, be careful what you wish for. It's true. It turns out it's empirically true, according to this, to this study, uh, that people who wanted to make money were making money. People who wanted to have a great career were working long hours, and they had a great career. People who wanted to be married were either married or engaged. People who wanted to have a good relationship with their family and friends had a good relationship with their family and friends. Good news. Set your goal. You're going to hit it. Careful, though. Conclusion number two, wrong goals, not such a great life, is what they found out. First, they asked the kids who had endogenous goals about love, about relationships, about family, about friends, about marriage, about God. They had a high level of life satisfaction. They had low levels of psychosomatic health com complaints. The kids who had exogenous goals, money and fame, anxiety, stomach aches, headaches, uh, sleeplessness, and uh, depression. Sounds great, doesn't it? That's what happens when you have the wrong goals. When you substitute something for what you really seek. It's actually as old as the hills. St. Thomas Aquinas once said that there are four substitutes for God. Money, power, pleasure, honor. By honor, he meant fame. Not honor like we understand it today. Money, power, pleasure, honor. Those are the four substitutes for God. You find somebody who's missing God, use this diagnostically. It's gonna, it's gonna, you're really going to find this amazing, actually, if you write this down. Find somebody who needs God. I bet you wish you'd heard this before you went on your mission. So it's, <clears throat> you will have this as a diagnostic tool. It's money or it's pleasure or it's fame or it's honor or it's power or it's this stuff, right? Because the truth is, the world has a formula for your purpose. The world has trouble because the world has a wrong why. But it's very clear purpose. Very clear. Watch the movies. Turn on the TV. Look at the stuff that's bombarding you from Madison Avenue. You know what the, you know what the formula for a happy life is? <clears throat> you know what the formula for true sense of life purpose is? It's simple. It's got three parts. Love things. Use people. Worship yourself. That's it. Simple. Use people. Love things. Worship yourself. Do that, you'll be following the world. You got your substitutes for God, you're all set. Exogenous goals, you're on track. Will you be happy? Not so much. The data don't lie on this. And your heart, it doesn't lie either. And you know it's true. 
So the why of the world is wrong, which is why the world is wrong. <laughs> That's why we are the rebels. That's why we stand in opposition to it. That's why we, as those of intellectual training, who try to train our minds to lead better lives, also understand the truth behind what we really seek. What are you looking for? What can we do? What can you do with your goals? Well, let me make some suggestions here. Number one, make your work a gift. All of your work, a gift. And, and, and how do you do that, by the way? You remember that deadly formula I just told you, the world's deadly formula? Invert it and make it virtuous. The bad way, use people, love things, worship yourself. No, 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 turn it upside down. Use things, love people, worship God. If you invert the deadly formula, you render it virtuous. And this, in and of itself, can make all of your work a gift. Because you're not working for things, you're working for people. That is the whole idea to serve. That is the whole idea to work for the glory of God and the enjoyment of man. That's the whole idea of working for the salvation of souls, even though you're running for your own life. Extraordinary, isn't it? But there's one other trick, too. There's one other thing that we need to do, too, which is to remember the value of other people's work. We often forget this. We focus so much on our own work. We don't focus on, on the work that's going on around us. Um, the most disheartening phrase we hear in modern public policy, you know what it is? Dead-end jobs. Dead-end jobs. One time, I'll confess to you, I was, on a, I was on an airplane, and I recount this in my book, so I'm not just confessing it to you, I'm also confessing it to um, anybody who will buy the book, effectively. So, um, <clears throat> I was on an airplane, and, and uh, a guy sat down next to me and had the bad judgment of starting to talk to me. And he said, uh, you know, he, he, he would make a small talk. And, and I asked him, which is what I always do when some, I don't know somebody. I say, I say, you know, tell me about your job. Because I'm an economist. I'm, I'm very interested in other people's jobs, especially those that I don't understand very well. What do you do all day? What do you do first? And, and then what? And et cetera. It turns out he was the CFO of a company that owns 750 fast food restaurants, Burger Kings to be specific. CFO. And I thought to myself, I don't know anything about how Burger Kings work. So I was asking him about supply chain management and where they get their ingredients and the whole thing. I'm really into it. See, I'm, I'm a fun companion, you can tell. This is because I'm interested in this stuff. And, uh, and I offhandedly made a, a, a reference to something that I, I was very embarrassed about immediately afterward. I asked him, when I was thinking about something else, but I asked him, uh, do you ever feel like you're creating a lot of dead-end jobs? Right? Hmm. I, I should know better. <laughs> I should know better. And his face starts turning all red. And uh, I'm thinking, there's like two hours left on the flight. And it, he, says, he says, you got to understand something. There's dead-end culture. There's dead-end government. There's some dead-end communities. No dead-end jobs. He said, everybody in the C-suite of this company started out flipping burgers. He said, if you come to work and you don't go home early, you don't show up on drugs, you don't fight, you don't wander away. In a year, you'll be assistant manager. In three years, you'll be managing a store and you'll be making $76,000 a year. That's the truth. There are no dead-end jobs. There's a dead-end culture that tells people that one person's job is better than somebody else's job. And that's the problem, right? Because we don't honor the sanctified, ordinary work of other people. One of the things that we do in our community, when I say our community, I mean the community of people with hired with degrees, that went to college, that feel smart, all of us, right? You know, one of the things that we do, we think our jobs are really good, but other people's, not so much, and we feel a little sorry for them. If you honestly believe in the sanctification of ordinary work, that everything is an offering, if you believe that, then you have to believe that there's equal moral worth between running a hedge fund and trimming hedges. And if you believe that, then you're on your way to honoring everybody's work as an offering to you and as an offering to God, just as good as yours, which, of course, that's our connection to the divine, isn't it? One of the mistakes that we Catholics make all the time, Catholic theology often will say, work came from the fall. Right? Work came from the fall. No, 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 no. Read the Bible. God didn't say, 
relax in the garden. He said, tend the garden. It was about creative work. And if we sanctify our work in the way that we're supposed to, in the service of others, in the glory of God, and we honor the work of other people, we're well on our way to having a real answer to the question, why do you do what you do? Second. Second. Get out of the boat. Um, I told you about the Ark and the Dove. The Ark and the Dove. The two boats that, that George Calvert launched toward North America. Named, after, obviously, after the story of Noah. The 128 pilgrims stuffed onto these little boats, right? Why were they on those boats? To be on boats? To live on boats? To stay permanently on boats? <laughs> no, no. They were on those boats to get to the other side of the Atlantic and get off for the salvation of men, according to them, right? This is important. Why? Because if your life purpose is true to the service of others, it means you have to be looking forward to getting off your boat. So ask yourself, am I doing that? I mean, look, this is the Ark and the Dove. We're in the Ark and the Dove right now. Right? It's a choppy sea. It's a source of protection. It's conveying us to some from one place to another. But we're supposed to get there and get off. How do we know that we've gotten off the Ark and the Dove? How do we know we've gotten off our boats? Because we're just a little bit uncomfortable. Because we're not quite cut out for the place. Because we're not invited. And it's clear to us that we're not invited. That's when we know we're doing it right. How do you know you're doing it wrong? Because you're 100% in your element, completely comfortable. I talk to a lot of politically conservative groups. You know, Tea Party rallies, right? You know, the, the Tea Party patriots of the three-cornered hat or something like that, right? And these, and these, I mean, these, these guys are just all in for conservative politics, all in. And I ask them, when was the last time you sat down and had supper with a liberal? I didn't raise your voice. When was the last time you tried to hear a liberal's point of view, what they were all about, and didn't try to denigrate their morality right from the get-go and blow them up? Hmm. That's hard to do, isn't it? Because the ark and the dove are more fun, because they're people just like us. It's kind of a pain to get out of the boat. But if we don't, guess what happens? We don't get to share with the people who need us to share with them, right? Everybody on the ark and the dove has already got it. Everybody that's like, yeah, yeah, we're Catholics. We're all going to Maryland. They're all going to the same place. They all have the same faith. What they want is to get off and to be uncomfortable and to be in danger, to be a, a little bit out of their element. Are you doing that? This is the question for the rest of your life and the rest of my life, too. It's tricky. It's challenging. But it's the right thing to do because it's what we're called to do. And if we do that, then the expanse, the concentricity, the... the influence of what we're doing will grow. Men, as Joseph Smith once said, are all made for enlargement. Hmm. Maybe that's just what that means. So where are we? The least important question is the one everybody's going to ask you. What are you going to do? The most important question is the one that nobody's going to ask you, but you've got to ask yourself, why am I going to do it? no matter what it is. Before you graduate, and as you graduate, I'm going to ask you to do three things to put this into practice. If anything I've said to you today resonates with you, I'll ask you to do two, three things. Number one, write down your purpose. Write down your mission statement. Write down your why. Very personal. It's yours. And now, from now on, look at it every year on your birthday. Say, am I living up to my own why? Still the right why? Write it down. Because if you can't write it down, you can't measure it, you can't pursue it. It has to be specific and it has to be tangible. Number two, make sure it's not about you. <laughs> make sure your purpose, your why is not what I'm going to achieve. No, 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 no. How I'm going to serve. What I'm going to do that serves others in new and fantastic and creative ways. Be as ambitious as you want, just never for you, for your cause, for your faith, for your God, for your community, for those who don't share your views, don't share your faith, don't even like you or know you. Serve them. That's number two. And number three, 
go where you're not invited and share it. Look, if we do these things, then we can continue to change the world. You've done a lot just by your prayers, just by your studies, just by the ambition that you have to do important things. But if you can gear it this way with a statement of purpose, with an understanding of why, and I do that too, then together we can go forth into the world and make it that much better. God bless you. I'm praying for you and your important work. Congratulations in advance on the wonderful things you're going to do. And most of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for questions. And I would love to know anything that's on your mind. The tricky one is the first one. So who's, uh, who's brave? The, the microphone is over there. We have house rules at the American Enterprise Institute, where I serve as president, by the way. It's always state your name and put your protest statement in the form of a question. I'm not that worried that that's going to be a problem here. I, uh, <laughs> My name is Ben McKay. Hi, Ben. Hear me. Um, I was just wondering, as, as you've um, progressed in your life and reached some of your goals and your mission statement, or at least are, you know, along that path, how have you been able to kind of keep a level head and you know, make sure that your goal doesn't change to get caught up in the popularity or the fame or the, you know, the media or, or whatever? Well, I'm married and have teenagers. <laughs> and uh, there's nothing that will bring you to earth faster than that, than family life. Actually, that's one of the reasons that God gives us families, <laughs> is because that way we remember that we're really not important at all, uh, or really that good at all, quite frankly. Um, it's, it, there's going to be a challenge to anybody, and, and you're going to have this challenge in your life too, Ben, is you're going to be doing something that, that you're going to get a lot of strokes for. And People are going to tell you what you're doing is really great, and people are going to applaud for all that. And that's when you remember that you're nothing more than a reflecting pain, that every clap that comes to Ben is just reflected straight up. Because as, as President Obama once said, you didn't build that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the politics, folks. But, that's, uh, but, it's, but it, and I, I didn't agree with him when he said that, but I do agree with this particular sentiment in this context, because you know, we really don't build these things. And that, ultimately, that's what you have to remember. And that's what we all remember. All right, thank Thanks. you. Hi, my name is Matt. Uh, I have a quick question. So I love your work on happiness, and and sometimes you go on uh, Facebook or whatnot, and you see like, oh, the ten happiest places in the world, the ten happiest cities in America, and I'm always expecting to see, oh, Provo or most Salt Lake City or different places in the West or like the like family oriented place in like this like the, the heartland, you know, but you always end up finding, oh, Seattle, Portland. The Netherlands or Luxembourg, and I'm thinking, how do these more like secular places more? I don't, I don't know if you can judge them all together, but for me, it, I didn't really understand why. It, if you kind of explain potentially, or maybe they're completely wrong and they're just trying to uh, trying to push something, but I don't know. What, what is your sure? Say on absolutely. That? So, I appreciate your question. Um, so there are a lot of studies that try to compare places that are happy. And you know, I, I started by mentioning this whole set of studies that say that you know, this place is such an incredibly happy place. But the truth is, you can't really compare locations, because people answer questions in different ways, it turns out. So there are a bunch of studies that show that Denmark and Sweden are the happiest countries in the world. Have you ever been to Denmark? It's like everybody's really bummed out. I mean, how could that possibly? be the case. It's because how they answer the question. Now, the German, by the way, Germanic countries tend to do really well because the, the, the origin of the word for happy is glücklich. It's, it means lucky. Happy and lucky mean the same thing in Germanic languages. If you go to, to, to uh, uh, Latin-based languages, it means felicitous, which is entirely different. The, the, the words are derived from different philosophical contexts in different places. So, of course, you would answer it in a different way. My, my wife is from Barcelona. If you went around asking people in Spain, how happy are you? I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in the depths of absolute worst clinical depression you can possibly find. You'd always say you're happy because you don't want bad luck. 
right? You'll just answer it in a particular way, but not too happy, because you don't want that kind of bad luck either. I mean, people are really superstitious in certain ways to answer these questions. So what you really need is a more sophisticated analysis of these things, and when you do, you find that there are, uh, that, that people, you find happy people every place. I've, I spend a lot of time in San Francisco because I'm one, the chairman of my board lives in San Francisco. And you know, everybody's really unhappy all the time. I go to Dallas, and San Francisco, by the way, is a beautiful city with the best weather in the universe. I go to Dallas and it's like, it's bugs and it's 119 degrees and, and, and people are like, good morning. What's the deal? The deal is basically for things, which are the happiness portfolio of people, okay? Forget the locations, forget those geographic studies. Remember the happiness portfolio, the four predictors of human success as measured in life satisfaction and a sense of meaning, okay? They are, it's gonna be real shocked at you. Faith, family, community, and work. That's what they are. I mean, and, and here's the biggest problem is, by the way, when I do a diagnostics, because when you, when you write about happiness, people are coming up to you afterwards and they're telling you these incredibly personal things. You feel like a psychiatrist. And I, one of the things that I find is I can almost always say either they're missing one of these things or that their happiness portfolio is out of balance. Ordinarily, when I'm talking to men my age, it's because they're working all the time and they're marginalizing faith, family, and friends. That's ordinarily what's going on. But the bigger of the two is that they're, they're missing. They're missing something from these. Now, again, we talk to a secular audience. You say, well, you just go to church. You'll be all set. Right? That turns out not to work very well. It turns out not to be a very good opening pattern. But again, this is what you really have to look at. Number one in the regression analysis, the statistical analysis that will predict these things, by the way, is marriage. Number one is marriage. You find that, that faith is important. You can't distinguish in happiness between different faiths, but practicing is critically important. But marriage in every culture is critically important, it turns out. By itself, marriage brings up your likelihood of saying you're a very happy person by 19 percentage points. Just marriage. You know, it's the happiest thing you can do, especially to men who can't quite figure this out until it's a little too late. Get married. Get married. You know, sometimes when I, I write a column for the New York Times, and I wrote a column on last Valentine's Day, and I had in my head, you know, if this is successful, I mean, my measure of success will be somebody calling his girlfriend and going over to her apartment and proposing. Because I know this is what's gonna make people happier. By the way, kids, what do kids do? At the margin, by itself, they bring happiness down by six percentage points. <laughs> All the parents are like, mm -mm. But, but they give you more meaning, on the other hand, and they take care of you when you're old. So, uh, uh, in theory, mine won't. So. So there you are. Those are, those are the big four. Pay attention to those things and forget what they say about Seattle. That's My hometown, perfect. by the way. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Longer answer than you were asking for. Who's, who's next? Anybody next over there? Only two questions. Somebody's got to denounce me for something. Okay, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. So AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, where I serve as president, has been around since 1938. And it's a very academic place. It has academic freedom, where I don't censor people's work, et cetera. Um, but we have a very strong mission statement. And the mission statement I know by heart because I wrote it. <laughs> and the mission statement is that we're a community of scholars and supporters dedicated to the proposition that maximizing liberty, increasing individual opportunity, and fighting for free enterprise gives the most people the best life. Nothing about business, nothing about money, nothing about finance, nothing about commerce. It's all about giving more people a better life, which creates a natural bias to have a preference for people who need the blessings of free enterprise the most. Who are they? The poor. <laughs> That's who they are. See, the rich are doing fine without more free enterprise. The poor are being left behind because they don't have sufficient access to the freedoms that will set them free because they're treated by society as liabilities to manage, by the welfare state and the criminal justice system as liabilities to manage, as opposed to assets to develop, which everybody is a child of God is an asset to develop. And we don't treat them like that. So you have to push free enterprise all the way, opportunity all the way down, liberty all the way down to those folks, and then it gets into the interesting part, which is implementation. But it always starts, by the way, this is purpose, right? 
Implementation must be predicated on purpose. Purpose before products, if you want to think about it that way. And then what are the products? Better public policy that leads us in these directions. And how do we measure it? We measure it in terms of the impact we're having on the policy making process by the number of people who are interested in and are being affected by our work. And we have a sophisticated set of metrics to get that done. We actually, we measure, I mean, you'd be surprised at all the things that we measure to make sure that we're getting things done and we can feed back to our donors because it's 100% philanthropy that supports this operation for all of this. But in the end, in the end, when we get together as an organization, all 225 of us at AEI, I do one, I only give them one speech a year uh, as an institution. I say, <clears throat> to bring it back to what matters, I say, examine your conscience. We need an examination of conscience. Before you go to sleep tonight, I say to my, my colleagues, before you go to sleep tonight, and I submit this to you for your consideration as well, before you sleep tonight, ask yourself, did all of my work go for the benefit of people with less power than me? If the answer is no, you're doing something wrong. As you did for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did for me. But if the answer is yes, get a good night's sleep and come back ready to fight and fight anybody and fight hard because you're fighting on behalf of people who need you the most. That's purpose-driven policy, and that's what we do.